time, we're in the book of Acts chapter 19. And as we are, if you brought a Bible, you can pick it up, you can open it to Acts chapter 19, you can find verse 11. And as you do that, let me just kind of bring you up to speed just a little bit as we're considering the story of the church. We're at a point where the gospel is continuing to go out into all of the world, or to use biblical language, to the ends of the earth. The gospel is going out. We find Paul in Acts 19 in a city called Ephesus. One of the things that's interesting to note about the city of Ephesus is it had a reputation for learning and the practice of magical arts. I dare you to go home, stand in front of a mirror, and see if you can say learning and the practice of magical arts, and see if you can do it without moving your body in an awkward fashion. It is a city that is overflowing. It was a city that was overflowing with spirituality, and not all of it was healthy. It was a place where there were forces at work that were working against humanity, not for humanity. It was a place where there were forces at work working against humanity, but holding out that they were actually trying to help humanity all the while they were hurting humanity. Do you get the picture here? This is what was going on, and I bring this up because I think it's the key to understanding what we're about to consider in the book of Acts. We have these moments where these, these work cloths and aprons of, that, that Paul had sweat on, that Paul had used, we have these moments where people are grabbing those, running out, and waving them over the sick and the hurting and the overwhelmed, and they're getting healed. Do you guys read, did you catch that? As we were reading it, how many people, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people were like, wait a minute, what in the, I have seen this on TV. And normally they want 20 bucks. Do you see what I mean? What is with that? Why is that going on? What is happening there? And not only that, then you see these, these seven sons of a man named Sceva who was a Jewish high priest. And I use quotes on purpose because I suggest to you that maybe he wasn't. Going out and saying, you know what, we're going to go out and try to make some money by helping some people. And I've heard that Paul is powerful and this Jesus whom Paul proclaims is pretty powerful. So here you go. And they use Jesus' name. Do you guys, did you notice when that happened? It didn't go well. They got beaten up, stripped naked and humiliated in front of everyone. I don't know about you, but I come across passages like this and I think, number one, it's super entertaining. <laughs> Why haven't we made a modern movie about it? Like, we got CGI and stuff. We could make a fantastic movie about this right now. And then I have to realize, well, wait a minute. All the stuff that would make for a fantastic movie may not necessarily be the main point. Like, what is going on here? Furthermore, there's going to be a riot in Ephesus that we'll read about. A riot that is led by a silversmith whose job it was to make little silver idols of the goddess Artemis, the goddess of fertility, that he could sell, and then people would sell those to make money. And that money-making proposition is hindered by the presence of Paul and the apostles and the gospel that he's communicating. People start to have their lives changed, and so they get rid of all of those things, and Demetrius, the silversmith, is saying, listen, this isn't good for business, man. We're going to go out of business if this keeps up. And so he starts a riot. All the while, I don't know about you, but as a modern-day American, I'm reading it thinking, what? okay, but how does that apply to my life today? Well, here's the interesting thing. I think it's worth remembering that all throughout the Scriptures, in the Old Testament, in the not-so-Old Testament, I didn't know what to call the middle. <laughs> I didn't want to say Middle Testament because then you'd be thinking, wait, there's more than two? No, there's not. But all throughout the scriptures, we'll just say it like that, all throughout the scriptures, on a regular basis, you will see God encountering the forces of evil. And when he does, he leaves no doubt about his power and who he is over and above theirs. Does that make sense? Let me remind you of a couple. Do you remember all the way back in the book of Exodus, chapter 7, where God is going to deliver his people out of Egypt? You guys remember this? He's going to deliver his people out of Egypt. And you remember in chapter 7, Moses starts putting upon the Egyptians a series of 10 plagues. You guys remember this? 
And if you just read that, you think, okay, it was really important in God, that God, through Moses, gets Pharaoh's attention in order to let his people go in your best Charlton Heston voice. If you're younger than 30 and you don't know what a Charlton Heston voice is, I highly recommend you go to YouTube and you Google, let my people go. Did I just tell you to go to YouTube and Google? <laughs> I'm old. I can't even talk about what the kids do these days without sounding like an idiot. Just go and look it up. Here's the deal. What is God doing? Was he simply just trying to get Moses' attention, just trying to get Pharaoh's attention? Or through each one of those plagues, was he showing his power over and above one of the Egyptian false gods, which is exactly what he was doing? You fast forward a little bit to the time of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah shows up on the scene. He's being chased down by some terrible people. And he has a showdown, if you will, a confrontation with the prophets of Baal. The prophets of Baal who are calling upon their God who they believe to be the most powerful God. And so there's a showdown that, goes, that happens where Elijah's like, well, wait a minute. I think Yahweh is more important than Baal. And they're like, nah, -uh, he's the most important and most powerful. And so he's like, okay, let's, let's have a showdown. So what they do is he gets together with the prophets and they build this big fire pit, a big fire pit. And Elijah suggests whoever's God is the most important or the most powerful is going to come down and consume the altar. And the prophets of Baal, Baal or Baal are like, yeah, let's do it. So they build a fire or they build this fire pit. And Elijah looks at them and he says, you go first. <laughs> I said first service because he was a polite man. But he invites the prophets of Baal to go first. And so they start chanting to their God to come down and consume the altar. And if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 18, you'll read that they chanted all day long and he never showed up. So then they decide, okay, maybe he can't hear us. Maybe he needs to hear us and see us. So they begin to dance around. This is what it looks like. Did you like that? I'll show you. They begin to dance around. And it says that they raved and danced all day long to try to get Baal's attention. But he still doesn't show up. All the whale, all the whale also known as while. All the while, Elijah's sitting back going, where's he at? What's he doing? We're then told in, in, in 1 Kings chapter 18 that the prophets are raging, raving, dancing. And they begin to cut themselves. They begin to bleed for God's pre or excuse me, but all's presence, but he doesn't show up. At which point Elijah interjects, maybe he's busy <laughs> in the bathroom. Are you with me? Elijah uses potty humor. I have a f almost five year old, and potty humor is a big deal. <laughs> Elijah's like, maybe he's busy in the bathroom. The point is this, Baal never shows up, and eventually they go, all right, it's your turn. We tried all day long. You do what you can do. And he says, okay, it's my turn. Well, let's do this. This offering that we want God to consume, you know, come down and burn it up by fire, let's go ahead and make it wet. <laughs> Water it down. Let's make it. I want there to be no doubt. And so they do that, and Elijah simply prays, Lord, come and consume the offering, and he comes down and miraculously burns it all up. There's scene after scene after scene in the scriptures where God is exercising his power and authority over all the other powers that are at work within the world. A couple of things need to be noted. There are other powers at work within the world, and whatever you want to call them, you need to understand they are real. Paul himself says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and all the spiritual forces of evil that are in the heavenly realms at work, even within our world. There is a spiritual battle going on, and we have to remember that. But we also have to remember that God is more powerful than they. Even if you go into the New Testament with the ministry of Jesus and you go to Luke chapter, or excuse me, Mark chapter 5, there's this moment where Jesus is called to help this man who's, 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 who's uh, possessed by a demon. And there's this moment where Jesus is like, what's your name? And the demon says, Legion. I did my best not to use a scary voice. The demon says, Legion. I don't know about you, but whenever I read that, I have to do it during the daylight because if I read it alone at night, I get really freaked out. 
I've seen one too many horror movies. Legion. You know the story. Jesus exercises authority over this legion of demons and sends them into the pigs that peril over the edge into the lake. Do you, do you guys see that? The point that we're supposed to get out of these passages is there is one true God and he is more powerful than any other force that is work within the world. And my hope... And my prayer is that when we walk out of here, that becomes not just something we remember, but something relevant for our lives today. Because it is well within reason to believe that some of us are struggling with overwhelming circumstances, overwhelming situations. Some of us may even be struggling, even without our knowledge, against some principalities and forces that are at work within the world trying to get us to do things that we shouldn't do, or go places that we're not supposed to go, or affect our lives in a way that is constantly contrary to what God would have. It's important for us to realize there's a battle at play within this world, and we have a part to play, that we pray and we trust the one true God who shows himself to be more powerful than any other force at work within the world. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 11. It says, and God was doing extra, extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul, so that, that even the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Again, this is an interesting passage. It's an interesting passage because you have to think, wait, what is going on? I think one of the best ways to understand it is this. God is showing himself to be merciful to the just as well as the unjust. Don't forget that Jesus himself said about God that he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. So regardless of what we understand about it or what we would or wouldn't do, I don't know about you, that's not something that we would do. We all grow up and we have to understand that our experiences mold and shape what we think about godliness and God himself. And how many of us in the late 90s and early 2000s woke up in the middle of the night because you couldn't sleep and you turned on the TV and there you found a televangelist promising great blessing on a great many people as he wiped the sweat off his brow with a hanky that he would then call holy and offer its healing powers to any, I'm doing my best, to anybody, that to anybody who might have need. And all you got to do is pick up that phone and dial 1-800-I-NEED-A-BLESSING-NOW. Oh, and send in $20. And you will get a special pre-packaged, pre-anointed, pre-blessed napkin <laughs> in the mail. And everything that you've been hurting and struggling with will go away. Listen, I'm not trying to make light of anybody who bought into that. But make no mistake about it. I do think it's our job to call out selfish spirituality whenever we can. And recognize that God is bigger than all of that. That's essentially what was going on here. Most scholars believe that it wasn't Paul sending out people going, here, take this and go heal some people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Although you got to understand within the context of Ephesus at that time, this kind of thing was commonplace. People were doing it left and right. But most scholars believe that Paul wasn't necessarily doing it. It was people around Paul kind of waiting at the tent-making shop. And noticing that he just dropped a rag that he swept, wiped his brow with. And they know that the shadow of Peter has helped people. And Jesus could heal people with just a word. Maybe Paul's powerful too. And say, run up, sneak up, get the napkin and take it out to people. And look what God does. I don't know about you, but man, if I'm God, I'm like, nope, nope, nope. Hold on. Doesn't work that way. You have to come to church on a Sunday. Are you with me? That's what I would do if I'm God. Why? Because Sunday's attendance is really important. <laughs> but that's not what God does. Whether these people even believed in what they were actually doing or not, or doing it for honest reasons or not, most of them were doing it to just make money because that was the culture, the spiritual magic working culture of Ephesus. It doesn't matter one way or the other. God looks at people and he knows some people are hurting and they just need the, 
They just need his healing to rain down on them. And he works for the just and the unjust. I think if we recognize that that, 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 that is who God is, then it makes us, it should have a, an effect on us. We should be a people who give him and recognizes that he is worthy of our wholehearted hope. We live in a very skeptical world where everything is questioned and everything is analyzed and everything is thought about and nothing is even real anymore, even though everything is real. What if we recognize that the very same God who causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, what if we realize that in his grace, He wants to work in people's lives, even in ways that we don't even understand. And then when we recognize it, what if we just held out with a wholehearted hope in what he's able to do, even beyond my ability to comprehend? Are you with me? What if we looked and we saw that the world is in a much better place, even though most of us spend a whole lot of time complaining about how bad it is, but could you imagine how much worse it would be if this God of grace and compassion, mercy and power removed his hand from among his people and the earth itself? Colossians chapter 1 tells us that everything holds together because of his ability to keep it together. And can you imagine if he let go? What if we wholeheartedly held out the hope that he can have, that he can be to the people that deserve it or even don't deserve it? You see what I mean? If we'll be a people who recognize that he causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, then we will in prayer and in action and in word and in deed, we will hold out wholehearted hope to the world around us no matter who they are or where they come from or what it is that they're doing because Jesus can overwhelm it all. Like that's the reality of what happens. It gets better though. Look at what happens in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exercises undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. <laughs> Ephesus was a crazy, wild place, man. Spiritually speaking, it was not so. So what's happening is in Ephesus, you have guys that were Jewish by heritage. They've made their way to this, this Gentile city called Ephesus, And they recognize that they have a connection to Yahweh, the most powerful God. And so then they start using that connection to help people so that they can make money. There is no other way to say it. That's what was going on. And so when Paul shows up and he starts proclaiming Jesus, an extraordinary miracles start happening. Did you guys catch that phrase, extraordinary miracles? It's just my opinion that a miracle in and of itself is extraordinary. Are you with me? But then Luke says, no, these are extraordinary. These are extra extraordinary. I don't even know how to pronounce it, but they're crazy miracles. And the people are watching this and knowing and hearing that these things that are not normal are happening in the name of Jesus. And so others start using that name to try to pad their pocketbook. Side note, we should never use the name of Jesus to try to make more money doesn't go well so they go out we're told verse 14 seven sons of a jewish high priest named skiva were doing this just quick note on the seven sons of skiva it says that the seven sons of a high a jewish high priest named skiva first and foremost you got to understand that the outside world understood and held in high regard the jewish high priest They recognized that the Jewish high priest was super powerful, so powerful that on one day a year, he, according to his power, was able to go into the presence of God and not die. Now, we know Old Testament that that was pointing to the one high priest that was to come, Jesus. But they, if they're on the outside looking in and not believing in God at all, they're looking and going, man, whatever powers this Jewish high priest has, those are really powerful powers, and so what most scholars believe is there's a man, there's a, there's a man in Ephesus named, a Jewish man named Sceva, and he wasn't a high priest. He wasn't of the lineage of the Jewish high priest. It was just a title he gave himself to open up more business opportunities. Do you see that? This chapter is just crazy. 
So these sons of Sceva, who the, call, who the community understands this guy's really powerful because he says he's one of those Jewish high priests, and they're really powerful. So evidently, these sons, they do the same thing. They start thinking to themselves, you know what? We can expand our exorcism business by using the name of Jesus. So we're told in verse 15, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom there was an evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them so that they went out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, Greeks and a fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord was extolled. These seven sons superstitiously just start using the name of Jesus, but they don't actually believe in him. And somehow there's a demon that recognizes the faultiness of their faith and says, well, I know God, and I know Paul, but you boys I've never heard of. Let's go. And the spirit, it says overpowered and then stripped them, but let's just be clear. Beat the snot out of them. Took off all of their clothes and humiliated them in front of everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, ultimately, this is the desire of any force at work within our world that is not God himself. And it's important for us to realize that not only is he merciful on the just and the unjust, but it's important for us to recognize that his name must never be taken in vain. The book of Exodus, chapter 20, says this. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. I don't know about you, but I grew up being taught that to take the Lord's, the Lord's, the Lord, that, 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 Saying God was not good if you didn't, if you were just like, do you guys ever, can I just have permission to be honest? You ever hit your hand with a hammer and you just go, oh God. Now, how many of you, even when I said that, were like, Ooh. <laughs> this is not what that means. Do I think that we should just be yelling out God or GD or any other, you know, curse word using the Lord's name? No. I don't think that's good, but let's be clear about what taking the Lord's name in vain means. It means exactly what these seven sons were doing. It means trying to use the name of Jesus for your own personal gain, but not actually believing in the name of Jesus. That's what it means. And that's an issue, ladies and gentlemen, all around. His name should never be taken in vain. Because he's worthy of more than that. He's worthy of wholehearted devotion, not just superstitious spirituality that recognizes if we use his name in some sort of prayer or incantation, that maybe we can get what we want. He is no puppet that we can handle the strings of. He is God Almighty. And if we're going to take his name, then we should wholeheartedly take his name. He is worthy of our wholehearted devotion. If we're going to, if we're, listen, here's what that means. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, if we are going to call ourselves Christians, it means that we take on everything that the scripture says that is about, which by the way, goes beyond just Sunday. Did you know that? Like it plays out in Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. It means that if we call ourselves Jesus followers, then we try to do our best to live like Jesus. It means that we point our lives in the direction of our Lord. To do otherwise is to take his name in vain. You don't get to call yourself a Christian and then not do anything about it. Or worse yet, then just use his name whenever it benefits you or me. I've, I've caught myself being really finger pointy just there. But I hope you understand that we're all, we all have to reconcile this challenge. When you see these seven sons of Sceva trying to use the, names of, the name of Jesus, and then they get beat up, stripped, and humiliated in front of people, it's a warning, ladies and gentlemen. 
And sometimes the God who is merciful and compassionate and loving and kind is also just. And in his justice, he wants his people to recognize that his name is something, faith in who he is, is something that's serious. We're going to get to why at the end of the service, but it's serious and we shouldn't take his name in vain. If you continue on in verse 18, as we read... It says this, also many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who practiced magical arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found that it came to about 50,000 pieces of silver, or as somebody possibly told me in the middle of services, millions of dollars. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. What's worth recognizing, we're also supposed to see that his way is more important than any other way. His way is more important than any other way. His presence is meant to have a profound effect on on not only you, but the world that you take up space in and the people that you come in contact with. His presence has a profound effect on people. Look at what happened. These people come to know Jesus, and they're living in the midst of a city where idol worship is rampant, where magical spirituality is practiced by almost everyone, and everyone had a book, literally an Ephesian book of incantations that were available for any kind of circumstance that you needed help with. And so these people are literally, they come to know Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. One way. They come to know Jesus this way, and the effect that his presence has in their lives is they recognize, wait a minute, I got a whole bunch of things in my life that comes into con- that, that seems to be contrary to is. Well, what do we do about it? And I love this part. I said it first service. Here's what happens. A bunch of dudes get together, and they're like, I got an idea. Let's build a bonfire, because who the heck doesn't like that? All the ladies are like, oh my gosh, that sounds like a great idea. Just be careful and have lots of water. And first service... First service, I admitted, like, I don't know if you're supposed to say stuff like that anymore. But then everybody, before that I could get condemned, they're like, yeah, but it's true. (laughs) So they get together and they decide, let's build a big bonfire and burn away all the other ways from our lives. Let's give to the Lord a wholehearted commitment. Let me tell you, though, that before you go home... (laughs) Because I do believe that probably a lot of us have things in our lives that God doesn't want to be there. They, all of us in our lives in some way or the other, but whether it's a seen thing or an unseen thing, a mental thing, a physical thing, whatever, we probably all have stuff in our lives that maybe the Lord would put his finger on and say, hey, that, you probably might want to get rid of that. And let me caution you, before you go home and you pull out the 55-gallon drum, you throw a bunch of wood and gasoline, because that makes the best bonfires. And I grew up in Sands Valley. We know. Before you do that, it's not the action that matters most. It's the heart before the action that matters most. What I mean is this. I grew up in a time of Christianity, late 90s. I grew up in a time of Christianity, early 90s, where it was common and expected that we would take all of our secular music, You have to say it like that. Everybody just say secular music, right? (laughs) I grew up in a time in spirituality where we had to take all of our secular music and burn it up because God didn't want it. Because here's what would happen. If you dare put that cassette tape in your car tape player and hit reverse, Satan himself would pop out of your tape player and start casting down curses upon your life, right? They made movies about it, like, for goodness sake, in Christian circles, And what happened is the pressure was like, oh, I don't want that. And without actually, because who does, right? I don't want that. So without even checking my heart, I did what everybody else did at that time. All of my friends did at that time. We got a stack of cassette tapes. And this is the late late 80s. We couldn't afford more, so it was like 10 of them. (laughs) Our Our 10 best cassette tapes. And we took them and literally burned them in a fire. We felt good about ourselves for an hour. And then three hours later, we were at the mall, at the music store, buying the same cassettes all over again. Why? Because our heart was aching. You see what I mean? You see, the issue here isn't just like, hey, we should get rid of stuff that we don't think God wants, that somebody tells me doesn't belong. 
The issue is a heart that is wholeheartedly devoted to God, that wholeheartedly recognizes and is willing to take stock of their lives and say, Lord, whatever you don't want, we can do away with. And if you want me to burn it in the backyard, I will. But if you simply want me to just quit, I will. Do you see what I mean? See, these changes, they don't happen symbolically from the outside in. They happen spiritually from the inside out. I suggest one of the great lessons that we can learn from this chapter is saying, okay, Lord, here I am. Here's my life. Here is all that I believe in, hope in, practice, do, play. Here's everything. Is there anything that you don't want here? And if the Lord puts his hand on that through a still small voice, through a scripture, through even one of his people or the Holy Spirit, whatever it is, through circumstances, if the Lord puts his hand on it, then just do away with it. Maybe you need to build a bonfire, but maybe you don't. Maybe you just need to turn away. Do you see what I mean? And just so you know, it's probably going to be an ongoing process. It's not just going to be a one-time deal. What these people did on that day, they probably had to do every single day. Maybe they didn't build a fire every day, but every day they had to walk through and recognize what in my life is godly and what is not, what belongs and what doesn't. If it doesn't belong, then we recognize his presence is supposed to have a profound effect on our life and we get rid of it because what he wants from us is a wholehearted, not only commitment, but he wants a wholehearted representation of who he is. He wants us to go out there for his glory without anything holding us back. Now, I just want to make this very clear before anybody misunderstands me. I am not saying that you should not listen to music that is not Christian music. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. At every moment and around every turn, you should be willing to hear the voice of God. And a song that's fine on Sunday might not be okay on Monday. You see what I mean? You just pay attention to his still small voice. He's not about drawing boxes around your life. He's about freeing you up from legalism and saying, here, I just want you to walk with me. And as you walk with him, pay attention to his leading. And if he leads you to turn away from something, turn away from it. If he leads you to burn something, burn it. If he leads you to walk away from something, then walk away from it. If he leads you to put something down, put it down. If he leads you to pour it out, then pour it out. Whatever it is... Just, Lord, let it be as a result of my relationship with you, not just because some pastor told me to do it. It's more important than that. Well, look at what happens next. It says this. Now, after these events, Paul res resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. Dalton's going to talk about that next week. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. He stayed in Asia for a while, and about that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way, for a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made shrines, silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together while the workmen in similar trades said, Men, you know that this business we have, from this business we have our wealth, and you see and you hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing and that she may be even deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were enraged, and they were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the, confused, with the confusion, and they rushed together in the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. Verse 30, but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. I actually love this about Paul. There's a riot breaking out because of Paul's ministry in Ephesus. It's affecting the businesses of the local idol makers, right? And so there's this riot going in, and they grab two of his guys, and Paul's first reaction is, well, I'm going to go get them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Paul's the kind of guy you want to hang out with. I'm going to go get them. But some of the other guys are like, no, 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 no. If you go in there and get them, you're going to be ripped to shreds. There is also wisdom in a multitude of counsel. So look at what happens. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd. The disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing while another uh, for the assembly was in confusion. 
And most of them did not know what they, why they had come together. And some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. There's a full-on riot. And we have to understand, in those days, in a Roman-ruled city, if you rioted or, or upset the peace, Rome would come down hard. But here's the interesting thing. It's worth noting that not only does his presence, is it meant to have a profound effect on the culture, but it will shake things up a little bit. It will shake things up a little bit. People should take notice. Do you see what I mean? There's this reality of our faith that actually upsets the status quo. This is part of the work that God does. And what he wants from us in that reality is a wholehearted commitment to live for his name. And when we do that, we recognize, well, it's probably going to upset the status quo. And maybe it'll do that on a citywide level, a national level, a global level, but definitely on a personal level. Have you ever gotten in an argument because of your willingness to represent Jesus no matter where you are and no matter what you've done? This is what we're talking about. And in those moments, we kind of have to trust the Lord and recognize that he is worthy of our trust. Paul has no idea what's going to happen to his friends or even himself. Here we go again. I'm going to get kicked out of the city and I'll probably get beaten and I might even die. He has no idea. But when our presence, which is God's presence in the world around us, in the world around us, upsets the apple cart... It requires that we have a wholehearted trust in who he is and what he is doing. We cannot panic. We can pray. That's what we should do. And I think we got to do more of that. We've got to recognize that our presence in our neighborhoods, our workplaces, or wherever they are, we have to recognize and not be surprised when God himself upsets the status quo. And when people get frustrated about that, we don't go in and try to fight them. We hold out, trust the Lord, and we pray for God's will and work to be done. But we have to recognize in the story of the the growing church that the presence of God made a difference in the world around. Like people were upset. People were frustrated. It had a profound effect on the culture. And we shouldn't be surprised by that, even when people are upset about it. Recognize this. They're not mad at us, even though they point the finger at us. What they're really mad at is the conviction that God is putting on their hearts through us. And in that place, just so you know, the point isn't winning the argument. The point is for someone to find forgiveness. So we don't go in and just fight all willy-nilly. I like Paul. He wanted to go in and throw hands. At least that's what I believe. He wanted to go in there and go, listen, I'm getting my guys out of there. And I'm Paul. I've read the Bible, and I can use it to bash you upside the head. The only reason I use that phrase is because some of us want to do the same thing. It's not the solution to the world's ills. It's not the solution to what is upsetting the world as it relates to our faith. The solution is we pray and we hold out hope in a God who actually wants to use all of these circumstances to bring about faith that leads to their forgiveness. That's what God actually wants. So we've got to hold out hope for that. Well, look at what happens next. Finally, it says in verse 35, and when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, does anybody else think it's hilarious And maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe I'm just thinking from my own worldly perspective in today's world. But there's a riot breaking out, a full-on riot that people are so afraid that Rome's going to hear about it and come down and put it down. There's a riot breaking out. And they've had important people try to stand up and quiet it down. But we're told at the end of the chapter, and when a town clerk had quieted the crowd... And in my mind, it's a guy with a little derby hat and a little monocle. And he's going, okay, everybody. (laughs) Could you? And everybody's like, that guy? And the guy goes. And they all quiet down. What's going on here? Was the town clerk some superhuman, super powerful individual? Or was it God at work behind the scenes protecting his presence in that world? And not only his presence, but the proclamation of the gospel. So a town clerk 
quiets the crowd and says, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and the sacred stone that fell from the sky? By the way, that's just the origin story of how Artemis, this false goddess, came to be. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. Basically, this town clerk is like, listen, we all know that Artemis is more powerful than this Paul god. So just chill out. And if Artemis is truly more powerful, then she can take care of herself. Let's not do anything dumb. Let's leave room for her to be powerful, right? This is what this non-believing town clerk says. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are pro councils. He says, listen, Artemis can take care of herself. And these guys, if they really have a serious complaint, they can go through the proper channels. And you have this authoritative little town clerk going, this is the way it's going to be. And everybody's like, okay. Do you see what I, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Then he goes, let them bring their charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. He stands up and he says, listen, Artemis can take care of herself. If you really have a complaint, go through the proper channels. The rest of you sit down and be quiet. And let's just see this thing play out. And if you really want this figured out, then there's a way that we go about it. In the meantime... Chill out. These men are not doing anything illegal. And we don't, by the way, want Rome to come in with force and put us all down. We need to protect our ability to make more money in the future. Because if Artemis is really more powerful, then she'll protect that. But we know that that's not what happened. It says, while he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. One of the interesting things that we should realize is that God is always at work for the good of those who call him their God. This is one of those moments like in Romans 8, chapter 28, for God works all things out together for the good to those who called or called to him according to his purposes and plans. This is one of those real working out moments. We don't see the hand of God being worked out. In fact, all we hear is a mouthpiece of a little town clerk. But make no mistake about it, God is behind the scenes going, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to calm this down and I'm going to keep open the way for my presence and proclamation so that people may hear the gospel. This is what I'm going to do. And if that's how God is, then we should, we should among all people recognize that he is worthy of our wholehearted trust and obedience.